the state legislative session and some of the most controversial bills are coming in for a landing fueled by the Republican supermajority signed or about to be by the governor and not without hours of debates and some serious protest. We continue to host as many South Florida lawmakers as we can to talk about their positions and their votes for you. And with us today, two South Florida state reps from either side of the aisle who also represent some of the Broward cities struggling with flooding right now. Chip LaMarca, Republican representing Coastal Broward from Fort Lauderdale to Lighthouse Point. Hillary Cassell is serving her first term, a Democrat repping Dania Beach, Hollywood and Hallandale Beach. And it is really good to see you both today. Thanks so much for being here. Glad to be here. So we'll get to bills. Nice to and, be here. Thanks for having us. Of course. We're going to get to the bills in just a minute. Um, I want to sort of just stay with this kind of weather phenomenon that both of you have constituents suffering at the moment. Um, Chip Lamarca, let me start with you. You were both in Tallahassee when this happened this week. How Take us through how this news of this unfolding calamity bubbled up to the state legislature. What, how did you hear this? Well, Wednesday evening, uh, I was coming back, uh, leaving the Capitol and got a phone call from uh, some folks in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, I spoke to Greg uh, Chevaria, the city manager in Fort Lauderdale, who he and I have been in contact every day since this happened, uh, as well as the District 4 Commissioner Warren Sturman, who's down in, uh, in, in the south part of the city where all the flooding really was. And uh, we, you know, we, we work directly with the state, with Kevin Guthrie at uh, Division of Emergency Management, which we want to thank him first for his you know, amazing work through through COVID and then hurricanes. And now we have these, you know, weather events like this. And it's it's really about connecting resources. And the city uh, has been uh, in contact with us and asking for what they need. And I know that the county had uh, an issue with the emergency order, but ultimately got that uh, worked out. And the mayor, uh, Mayor Lamar Fisher and, and uh, Mayor Dean Trentellis have been in contact with uh, the state and the resources are flowing now. And I know it, even as we speak, we mentioned that uh, the Division of Emergency Management Director Kevin Guthrie and a lot of other people are about to have a, a press conference to update everybody uh, on the ground here in real time. Hillary Cassell, you represent Dania Beach, where there was actually one of two tornadoes touched down. And we saw some of your constituents dealing with just kind of that narrow spot damage. Um, tomorrow, you are on the infrastructure committee, which meets tomorrow, but none of the bills you'll be talking about tomorrow have anything to do with this. Uh, what do you forecast a little bit for me? Is this going to be the sort of spark for some legislation to come? You know, it's it's not only should be the spark, it should be the, you know, the 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 grenade that lets us know that that we're in trouble. You know, as you know, I'm I'm a property insurance expert. That's my area of specialty. Yeah. So really communicating with residents and letting all Floridians know that flood is really the next, you know, portion of the climate control crisis that we really need to deal with and really educate residents that we need coverage and we need to make sure that people have coverage and have the ability to rebuild after things like this because it's not a matter of if as we've saw, seen this week it's a matter of when you know get I personally can't get access. half of the street to get out of my own neighborhood there are cars still stuck in major floods my district aides home was flooded and was unable to get access to our office on Friday so this hits really close to home and obviously the legislature isn't likely going to rebound with bills on Monday, but I anticipate speaking with the chair of that larger infrastructure chair pain to figuring out, do we need to call a special session? Do we need to try to advocate some for some additional resources in the budget as we prepare to engage in appropriations communications and conferencing this week? to get some assistance to my community. So that will be a top priority for me. You know, you brought up a, a really good topic, flood insurance, which is offered at a, at a much lower rate to homeowners than the property insurance on the private market or even citizens, because flood insurance is a national pool, but it's not required for everyone. I, and you both represent such coastal cities. I know Chip LaMarca, you, you have a lot of constituents who are required to have flood insurance if they have a mortgage, but do, have you, sort of gauged how many people are dealing with floods and the aftermath of, of flood damage that are not insured for that? It's a great question, Glenna. I'd give you an example. Uh, when the last flood maps came out, I am right at the mouth of the Hillsborough Inlet and in Lighthouse Point uh, on a dry lot side of the street. And I actually am not required to have flood insurance to, uh, for my uh, mortgage, but we keep it. It, it. It's the cheapest insurance you can buy for the most bang for your buck if God forbid anything happens like this. 
And it, it's something that we, we really need to look at. I mean, I, going back to 2007, 2008, we talked about a na national catastrophic fund and what is going on wrong with flood map, the flood process in, in D.C. But, you know, at that point, the n northeastern states were saying, hey, well, you have all the hurricanes down there in the mid 2000s. We don't want to pay for your damage. And then they had Sandy. Every other state has some type of calamity that hits hits them from a natural uh, disaster perspective. And I just think it's something we should look at as a, uh, a federal model. I mean, obviously, we've got to figure out what the affordability number is, but ultimately we can't have people that are unprotected and we got to make sure that uh, that we we have a product that they can purchase that uh, God forbid something like this happens, that they'll get uh, relief. Yeah, you know, I actually remember reading about some of that when the state was considering that pool. And I think I remember f there are five states, and I don't remember which ones, five states are, are the only states that don't have some kind of calamity like tornadoes or fire or flooding or, or something like that. So maybe that's worth revisiting. Hillary uh, Cassell, we had so many talks about property insurance on this program with you and others. And, um, and I know there is a bill uh, on on the books on the table right now to sort of hold insurers accountable for lowering rates after the last two in the last year bills that went through to help them survive as businesses where where is that in in the process so it's still working its way through its committee i don't serve on any committees that will hear that bill the first time i will likely hear that bill will be if it makes it to the house floor i have had an opportunity to review it but this is something that i've been advocating for in the legislature prior to even being elected i've been advocating as a consumer advocate for the last five years that insurance accountability is really one of the bigger problems you know we it's very obvious that the uh, reforms that have been passed over the last several years aren't actually the reforms that are necessary to bring people's premiums down and we need to fix that you know we're we're preventing access to the courts we're making it harder for consumers to actually hold their insurance companies accountable yet without any relief in sight actually several insurance companies have asked for rate increases as high as 60 percent and condominiums are asking for increases of over 100%. So it's it's quite evident to me that the Republican-controlled legislature doesn't understand this issue and don't, don't have their arms wrapped around it. And as a result, everyday consumers are still going to suffer um, and continue to pay the highest premiums in the country. It's going to be a very tough year for a lot of people. Um, I would love to get into some of the bills that uh, actually one that the governor signed this week. We have a quick break and we will be back with Chip LaMarca and Hillary Gassell in a couple of minutes. Stay tuned. Representatives Chip LaMarca and Hillary Cassell from uh, R&D, respectfully, from both from Broward's coastal cities. I want to turn now to some of the big bills of the week. And, you know, there's so much I know that goes on in, in session that is so bipartisan and so important for the state. And this session, some of those culture clash bills have really been sucking up all the oxygen in the room. This week, the governor actually signed the bill that makes uh, pregnancy terminations a bit more restrictive to six weeks. And there was hours of debate before the preceding floor vote this week. Um, you both voted no. All the Democrats voted no. But there were some very interesting votes um, from the Republicans, especially in South Florida. Chip LaMarca, you were one of those who crossed party lines. Take us through the thought process and your vote voting against that bill. Well, thanks, Lena. Um I would say, uh, you know, in, in your description of pregnancy termination, I think it's it it, it uh, that that's putting it lightly. I mean, listen, we we dealt with abortion last year, and we dealt with a 15 week ban, and uh, you know, I had uh, this this is a struggle for me. I'm a Catholic. By I have an uncle who's a Catholic priest. I spoke with him about it. I spoke with my wife about it. Um, 15 weeks uh, for me was where I thought we. Would create more pro pro life uh, uh, situation for for people in the state of Florida. It would allow people to have uh, that procedure, but it would also be safe, safe and legal, but exceptionally rare. And for me, that was where I wanted to be. I think that's where my district uh, constituents are. And ultimately, six weeks was just it, it was a number I could get to. Uh, I, I very very much respect life, and I'm pro life. And you know, I had this conversation of you know. We, we're at this point now where we're basically talking about a number. 
And for me, is something in a practical world possible in, in six weeks? I just didn't see where that was. So that's why I was a no on the, on the, uh, the issue. And you say things that are we've heard very similarly from other South Florida Republicans. Uh, Vicky Lopez, rep from Miami, also mm -hmm. cast an opposing vote. Um, in the Senate, Alexis Kaladiud from Miami cast an opposing vote. There are a couple of South Florida lawmakers that did not vote at all. Fabian Basabe from Miami Beach, Jim Mooney from the Keys, Dottie Joseph, who's a Democrat from North Miami. Mm -hmm. um, Hillary Cassell, this bill, all we talk about really when we report on it is the abortion restrictions. But I should say law because the governor signed it now. But there is millions in that bill for uh, pregnancy support, for maternal support, uh, newborn support. Did anything about those kind of components in the bill really make you step back and, and think about your vote? Um, thank you for that question. I, I do just want to highlight for people that are listening, while the governor has signed the bill into law, abortion access and health care is still available in the state of Florida. The law actually does not go into effect until additional factors come into play, which primarily is going to be the decision of the Florida Supreme Court in Planned Parenthood versus state of Florida. So I want to be very clear to those constituents and residents of Florida that are listening it's still available, it's still accessible. While it's been signed into law, it is it is not um, in effect yet. Um, yes, and thank, thank you very question, much for pointing that out. I appreciate that. Um, but but going back to your question, you know, the reality is it's, it's very smoke and mirrors what that $25 million covers. That $25 million is going to very specific what are being referred to as, you know, pregnancy crisis centers, but they're all, um, smoke and mirrors. They are people uh, espousing religious beliefs. They, many of them aren't actual medical providers. They are there to discourage women from seeking that access and making it more complicated. So all we've done, and Representative Lamarca mentioned it and he, when he talked about his faith, is we continuously in the state turn our head away from the First Amendment, which is freedom of religion. You know, and I also want to comment on the fact that Representative Lamarca did vote on the 15 week ban. And maybe if more Republicans stood up last year and voted no and stood up to the governor, we wouldn't be in a position where we're even considering a six week ban. But here we are because the Republican Party rubber stamped the 15 week ban and now we're back. So well, let me, um, let me, dollars of smoke and mirrors for pregnancy crisis centers to keep people from accessing safe and legal abortions based on I, a violation, in my opinion. I, I, would, I would like to hear history. you respond to that, Rep. Lamarca. Yeah, um, Hillary is a friend, but I, I couldn't disagree more. It, the First Amendment is free, uh, freedom of religion. It's not freedom from religion. Um, people who have a, a faith in, in, in life and a belief in life, um, if they go to a pregnancy uh, help center, uh, ultimately, th that care, those millions of dollars, that $25 million is to help put somebody in a situation where they can afford to, uh, how to figure out how to, how to deal with their job and their timing and, and resources to be able to have that child. Um, I, I don't think smoke, I think smoke, we're talking about life. I don't think smoke and mirrors is something I would insert in this conversation. And as far as, you know, my vote last year, uh, like I said, I believe in life, but I, I think six weeks is, to me, it's a trap. Um, and I want to go back to one of the things you said before about the members who did not vote. And I'll be very careful about this because uh, Representative Mooney was dealing with a family crisis, uh, an accident in his family, and he was not there. But anyone who took a walk in that boat, I have a real problem with that because this is one of those things you can't hide. You can't walk away from. You're either a yes or you're, you're a no because your constituents deserve better. Hillary yeah. was a was where she was, uh, you know, on it. And I was where I was on it for, for different reasons, but at least the, the constituents that we have know. And so someone to have taken a walk on that vote to me is, it's, it's not good. I just, I just want to mention to your point that um, I, I ascribe no judgment to who did not vote. And I know Representative Mooney um, had family issues. I believe Representative Dottie Joseph also had a uh, a family issue as well. Uh, Fabian Basabe, I don't know why he didn't vote, but he did not. Hillary Cassell, what that representative said during the week, uh, kind of pointed his finger at Democrats for not compromising on what he felt would be a 12 week limit. Your response to that? My response to that is show up and do your job. You know, if he really thought that that was an option, there's an amendment process and he could have put Democrats on the board to actually support his accusations. And the reality of the situation is Democrats with the language presented in the 15 week bill 
weren't willing to compromise. We believe in the precedent set by Roe v. Wade. That is what we are fighting for. We had legal precedent for 50 years that has been in place, and that's the standard that we believe uh, Floridians in the nation um, is comfortable with. So he should have showed up to work. He could have filed an amendment. He could have put us on the board and actually supported his accusations, he, but he didn't show up to work that day. We, uh, we want to talk about the bill that redoes the standards for death penalty, and we will do that and talk about your votes on that when we come right back. Chip LaMarca and Hillary Gassell, both of Broward County, talking about the big bills this week. One in the House that passed the House was to redo the standards for Florida's death penalty. No longer will it need to be a unanimous by the jury if the governor signs this. Instead, eight out of 12 jurors, a direct outgrowth of what happened in the sentencing phase for the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High shooter. Um, you both voted yes on this bill. Hillary Cassell, let's start with you. Um, just take us through that vote. Sure. You know, it, 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 was a, it was somewhat of a difficult decision for me. I've struggled with my views on the death penalty, but I'm a former assistant state attorney um, here in Broward County. So when we talk about beyond a reasonable doubt, I understand what that means in practical application. And where we have inequalities in our justice system start well before we get to that place of a 12-0 guilty unanimous verdict, which this death penalty bill still requires. And it still requires beyond a reasonable doubt, and it still requires a 12-0 to 0 vote on aggravating factors. Where most people's issues and my issues, frankly, with our justice system and where those cracks lie is the guardrails that are in place when we arrest and making sure that we have the right person at the table. And that comes into play in making sure that also people have access to good lawyers, making sure our state attorneys and our public defenders are well-funded so they can keep good talent to make sure that people are getting the best advocates on both sides and have the experience necessary to make sure they're actually prosecuting the right person. So when we get down to an 8-4 eight, eight, verdict decision in death penalty, Really what we're talking about is making sure everything that, that we do leading up to that is done, whether it's training our police, making sure biases are uncovered during training, making sure they have psychological care during it. Um, but for me, at the end of the day, in addition to what happened at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, you know, um, we need to have justice at the very end result. And I do think our community and those families were robbed of that justice in this particular situation. And at the end of the day, that's why I voted yes for all those reasons. Chip LaMarca, take us through your vote. Uh, again, uh, a, a real look inward as a uh, as a representative of, of this district and someone who's been involved in the political process for a long time. Uh, but again, as a, as, a, as a Catholic, I you know look at where the church is going and I have to make my decisions based on, you know, where I think, I, I think what Hillary said was really important with respect to the process getting there. But if ever there was a case where you have absolute proof and you have everything, all of the facts aligning and you understand what, what the punishment should and could be for this situation at uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. I mean, I, I've had the opportunity, you know, it's unfortunate why I had the opportunity, but to speak with and work with uh, parents like Tony Montalto and Ryan Petty and, and uh, school members Hickson and, and Aladef and, you know, when you have people on the left and the right and in the middle, all kind of saying the same thing and looking at the process and the system where, where it ended up. And then you have, again, at the end of this process, when we took our votes, you have uh, representatives like Cassell and, and Daly and other people who were, uh, you know, conflicted on it as, as I was as far as what the death penalty means. But what this means, um, that's where I that's how I got there. And I, mean, I think if you if you're going to have a death penalty, this was the case to have it. And. If you are just going to, you know, find ways to get around it, then just just eliminate it altogether. But uh, ultimately, I think it should be in extreme cases, and this was an absolutely absolutely an extreme case where there's a lot of terrible loss and lack of closure for these families, and uh, I don't want to see that ever happen again in the state of Florida. In the short time we have left together, I want you both to listen to something that one of your colleagues said in committee this week, uh, as that committee mm -hmm. took up 
one of the bills that would really change things for a transgender community as far as state paid uh, health care and a lot of other rules and regulations that they feel targeted by. This is State Rep Webster Barnaby from Deltona. Take a listen. The Lord rebuke you, Satan, and all of your demons and all of your imps who come and par par parade before us. That's right, I called you demons and imps who come and parade before us and pretend that you are part of this world. <clears throat> Chip Lamarca, I know this is, I apologize for asking this question to colleagues, but I think on behalf of yeah. your constituents, it's important to hear, you know, your reaction to that. Um, I was in the committee. Um, I was more than put off. I was appalled. Um, it seemed to go on forever. Um, I kind of sat and I said, all right, when, when is it going to stop? Um, I Look, I... I don't always agree with a lot of the activist uh, organizations that surround our LGBTQ uh, Q community. Uh, I have many friends and, and many constituents who I respect in it to a great deal and work with on a lot of issues from the LGBT uh, community. And I would just say that um, it was totally out of line. It was unacceptable. It shouldn't have happened in committee. Uh, I don't know that uh, anyone thought it was good. You know, anybody could have predicted that. And I, I do believe that, uh, you know, it was again, it was uncalled for. And that's not how I feel. That's not how the, the, the vast majority of any Republicans I've ever met in Tallahassee or worked with. I mean, people may have strong conservative views and may di differ with some of the some of these issues, but th that's not a place for this. I mean, th we go to Tallahassee to work together and we're expected to work together on like the next bill that comes up is. As, as Hillary said, I mean, we went from abortion to kid care, which is a tremendous priority of mine. And we got we got some great work done on that. You can't do that if, if you burn bridges. And for me, uh, that wasn't just burning a bridge. That was, you know, blowing it up. Hillary Cassell, I, I will say that the representative did eventually apologize for that. But, um, I, you're not on that committee, are you? You weren't there. I was not. But you heard about it or saw it because it dominated oh, I, I, the headlines for a day, yes. It, and it should continue to dominate the headlines. Um, that will never be easy to listen to. I am absolutely disgusted that the chair of that committee allowed that to continue to be discussed. These are members of the public. These are our constituents. This is the people's capital. This is where they come to tell us what they want us to do with their state and to be treated that way and to, to utilize religion. And again, I think this is very important to talk about. We are elected officials. There is a separation of church and state for a reason. And if you're pressing a vote button based on your religion, I said it in my debate on abortion, you're in the wrong job. You are here to help people and not place additional unnecessary burdens in their way because you don't agree. The fact that the speaker has done absolutely nothing to admonish this behavior the fact that the chair did nothing to stop him in committee goes to show you that they support what he said. If they didn't, he would be removed of his committees and we would have seen more um, discipline and reaction from the speaker's office and we haven't. So as far as I'm concerned, they're supporting his behavior. An apology after the fact, what, what does that mean if there's actual no consequences for the words that he said? It's unacceptable. We uh, are three weeks to go. I hope you both will keep in touch with us on other big things coming in for a landing. Chip Lamarca, Hillary Cassell, both state reps from Broward County. So great to have you aboard. Appreciate it. Good to be here. Thank you.